When I teach my secondary three algebraic modeling course, one of the problems that my students have when they get into the exam is when they're given a situation and they need to be able to tell whether it's a linear situation or an inverse situation. This confuses a lot of students and the problem is if it's a linear situation but you do inverse style math for it, then the chances are that you're going to get a very low mark on that question. Or the same if the reverse situation is true. But let's talk about how to tell the difference between those two situations. A linear situation is a line, a straight line. So we see in the graph, if they give us a graph, it's quite easy to see that this looks like a line and this doesn't. Inverse always takes a shape that looks like this. So at a glance, a graph really helps us to know which type of situation we have. And in fact, if they give us an equation, it's also not too difficult to tell at a glance. Inverse situations have a graph, uh, an equation of this form, and linear equations have this form. But they don't always give you a graph, and they don't always give you an equation. They don't always make it that easy for you. They may give you a table of values, and I'll show you a trick to tell which is which from a table of values. But even worse for most students, they may give you some text that describes the situation and expect you to be able to figure out the rest. Most students find it the most difficult to interpret text, translate it from English into math, and then be able to make the rest of the situation happen so that they're justifying their answer and earning marks. When you have a text situation, if you've practiced enough, you see clues that tend to indicate which one it is. Over here where we have $48, and we are dividing it by the number of people to see how much each person has to pay, that situation tells me that I'm doing a division and it hints at me that this is an inverse situation. When I see that there's an amount you pay just to start, and then you're being charged an amount per kilometer or perhaps an amount per hour or an, an amount per minute, that is an indicator to me that the amount to start is a y-intercept, and then the amount per minute or the amount per kilometer is a slope. Again, this comes with practice. But what we can do is we can use the information we're given to build a table of values, and then we have a little bit more to work with. If I have $48 and I'm splitting it with four people, I'm doing $48 divided by four people, and it's going to result in $12 per person. $48 divided by 8 people gives me $6 per person. $48 divided by 12 people gives me $4 per person. And now I have a table of values to work with. If I get into the bicycle taxi and I'm charged $3 before we go anywhere, that means if I go 0 kilometers, it costs me $3. If I go 2 kilometers, Two times two dollars per kilometer is four dollars, but I also have to pay the three dollars for just getting in. Four plus three is seven, I have that point. Four kilometers times two dollars is eight, plus the three is eleven, I have a third point. Now we can start doing our tricks with the table of values to see which of these situations we have. For the linear, the trick is called constant difference. And what that means is you are subtracting a y-coordinate from the next y-coordinate and seeing what the difference is. 7 minus 3 is 4. 11 minus 7 is the next pair of y-coordinates I can do with this, and 11 minus 7 is also 4. When you keep on getting the same answer from the constant difference trick, that answer is the constant difference, and it's telling you this is linear. If I try to do that here, it's not going to work. 6 minus 12 is negative 6. 4 minus 6 is negative 2. It's not a constant answer. So I try my next trick, which is called constant product. That involves multiplying my x's by my y's. 4 times 12 is 48. 8 times 6 equals 48. 12 times 4 equals 48. I keep getting the same answer from the product. 
the constant product is 48. And that's really useful because in this type of equation, that means my equation is y equals 48 over x. It's that fast to find the equation or the rule when you found your constant product. Here, 0, 3 is the point that's right on the y-axis. So therefore, my y-intercept is 3. I have y equals some slope times x plus 3. And then the $2 per kilometer is the slope. I have the equation y equals 2x plus 3. That means that the points 2, 7 and 4, 11 are going to appear on the graph like this. And this point, 0, 3, is there as well. 4, 12 in the inverse would be up here. 8, 6 would be around here. And then 12, 4 is over here. All of these things relate to each other. The graph, the equation, the table of values, and the text situation. In an exam question, they will give you some of that, and you need to be able to figure out the rest. This is an example of doing that for either a linear or an inverse situation, but it also is really focused on when you're given your information, how do you know which situation you have? Of course, you can always, in an exam, use the old trick of answering it both ways. So if you answer on half of your page the situation using linear math, and then you answer it on the other half of the page with inverse math, you have something that's worth marks on your page. It's less of a gamble than just saying, okay, I'm not sure which it is, I'll just answer it one of the ways and, and that's that. But what also happens is when you answer the question both ways, one of them will tend to make sense and the other one might not make very much sense. And that gives you a hint as to which was the better strategy to use. This is how we tell the difference between a linear and an inverse situation for a secondary three algebraic modeling course.